Lynn. Hi, beautiful. Hey. hey. Thank you for doing this. Have you ever done Instagram Live? I have done it once, but I was as confused as you were. <laughs> we just accidentally invited somebody <laughs> else to join in a joint for a minute. I saw that. <laughs> It was like the picture frames. And yeah, I was like, was like oh my is that me? Gosh, what happened? So how are you? I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited for pub day. Yeah. Um, I'm at the office. Is it too echoey? Is it okay? It's good. Am I good? I'm going to bring this closer. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Yeah, pub day. You know how this goes. Aaron wrote a book. How long ago? Years ago. Public? Yeah, when was that? It was 2019. 2019. Um, yes. I, was, I was very grateful it didn't happen during the pandemic. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to give you a little bit of a rest, and I'm going to introduce myself and introduce the day, because you have to do a lot of this, and I want it to be a little bit easier for you today. You're amazing. Um, um, I'm just, I'm so thrilled and honored um, to be with you on your publishing day for your memoir, Blood on Their Hands, Murder, Corruption, and the Fall of the Murdoch Dynasty. Um, I saw last night in some doing my research, because I am a documentary filmmaker, that you got incredibly rave reviews from Publishers Week, Weekly, Kirkus, like people are calling it, I think Publisher Weekly called it um, an engrossing true crime saga and a galvanizing code to boots on the ground journalism. What is it like to, to read that about your work? It's very exciting, uh, specifically because uh, my work has mostly gone just under the radar. I've been independent for the last couple of years and haven't really been a part of the critic world and i've been very terrified i always imagined pub day honestly as waking up to just like i don't know a million ter terrible reviews <laughs> <laughs> I've had that. i feel like that's like in the movies or so i don't know where i got that uh you wake up and like look at the newspaper and it's your book sucks um but no it's been amazing i i'm just feeling like oh my gosh finally this is all happening and it's out there and things are in place and everything's okay <laughs> I mean, that's the thing like basically even getting to this point knowing that you published a book is a huge part of the battle a lot of people basically do book deals and they they can't really do it right the pressure starts to get to them um, so I'm going to launch in some questions, but for those of your incredible community who don't know me, uh, I am a documentary filmmaker. I specialize in empathic true crime. I've made uh, films, uh, I'm nearing on 10 films for HBO and Netflix. A couple of the, the bigger ones are Mommy Dead and Dearest about Gypsy Rose Blanchard, the Michelle Carter case, um, which is I Love You Now Die, Britney versus Spears, the Netflix one. Um, and, uh, it's a, and also I am working on with the incredible Michael D. Fuller and the studio UCP to adapt, uh, Mandy's podcast for a scripted series for Hulu, um, which is, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's like, oh my God, can we get it into eight episodes? You know what I mean? Um, so I guess like you kind of said a little bit about, uh, that, you know, it's pub day. You thought you were going to wake up to a million bad reviews, but can you tell me a little bit about like what was the first thing that you thought of when you woke up today? I think it was just finally. Um, I had a really great night last night. We had a big crowd at the University of South Carolina. The University of South Carolina Journalism School hosted us and um, I signed books and it was, it was just an amazing, so I just, I went into this morning just being like, I've already won. Like, that was great. <laughs> um, everything is bonus from this point on. And that's kind of how I'm looking at it. I am just, I also kind of feel like my insides are out there in the world. And that's a little scary. I know that you wrote a very personal narrative too, Erin. And that, that's something that we connected with uh, very early on 
and I, I apologize for not giving you a better introduction. Erin is the documentary queen, filmmaker, best filmmaker in the universe. She's awesome. We met in 2021 and we're thinking about doing a Dur Murdoch documentary, but now we get the Hulu and now we get a, an even better project to work together on. So we're really excited how that ended up shaking out and yeah and but Erin with her work I've just always with your work I've always just been it was weird I was a fan of it for years and then uh UTA connected us and it was just really amazing yes. and, shout out to Neil Cohen yeah Neil I saw Neil in uh, New York when I was there a couple weeks ago shout out Neil you're the best <laughs> but uh, yeah I mean it was I think what we connect on is like victims first and complicated true crime stories. And we both get that, um, like what you did with the Gypsy Rose case that wasn't your average case where there's a bad person and you can just say that person's bad and that's it. Uh, he did, it's not a who did it type crimes that we focus on. And Aaron really understands the very complicated world that is the Murdochs. Um, and yeah, now it's in a book that's out there to the world. And it's very weird. And also Sarah Turney is here who just said hi, who's one of the most incredible oh, yes. um, like podcasters, people, humans. So it's amazing to be surrounded by people that have this thing in common. Because I think for a long time in this very sort of male dominated sphere of true crime, there is the, um, the incredible um, you know, the, the classic, which is Truman Capote. But then we really moved into this sort of tabloid journalism where we, uh, you know, it was really about the body count, the scene, everything like that. Like when you think of true crime, you think of like the 70s and 80s and the 90s and like, the, you know, the Daily Mail. And something that I love about your book, your writing, your creation is, you know, when you're covering, when you're talking about covering the trial, um, they, you know, there was such graphic detail in the Murdoch trial, but you on the podcast and things that you've written about, you're like, I don't really need to go into detail on this. Can you talk to me a little bit about that choice and that it's kind of, I think, a little bit of a revolutionary sort of act to, to make true crime, but to not go to that place where it's about the violence? Yeah. Um... I think that that just comes with the victims first, which is um, a part of our mission to give a voice to the victims. And with that, I always just stop to think about in my work, like is, is this necessary for the story? Is Sometimes there are gruesome details that are important, um, but they don't have to be so gross and so descriptive. And it does not, it does, does not help anyone and it only hurts people and when you're only reporting and when you're reporting something that's hurting victims more um i don't think that's a journalist doing their job i think that that's just kind of selling the story and being gross about it so i um it and the other thing is that the story is very complicated so a lot of times in the podcast we have to just be like okay they want us to focus over here but we've really thought about this <laughs> and over here is where we need to go and that journalism and i'm very i've always been very honest with my audience of when i'm stating an opinion how i gathered that how i came to that opinion um my my perspective where i come from and i think that that's really important in journalism versus just what I call like the white male perspectives that they yes. think that that's the end all be all and that's unbiased. I feel like a lot of times the white male perspective is viewed as unbiased, but it's really from their perspective. Um, so I, I have just kind of like developed my own style and thankfully millions of people have listened to it and enjoyed it. And um, a lot of people say that it's refreshing. It's a refreshing form of journalism because it's uh, they appreciate honesty and they appreciate me not hiding my, my opinions or hiding um, how my reporting came to be. I think that that's a very important part of journalism.
Absolutely. And speaking of white male perspective, oh my God, those you're writing about you as a young female reporter in these male spaces and what was said to you. Like I was very struck by all of the Murdoch stuff, but like that, it just, it was like, it made my skin crawl. Um, hearing you have to like fight for what is right, but then also like, you know, even when it comes to like Dick Harpoolian or like, you know, anything like that, like, you know, can you, can we discuss a little bit about that? Like, there are so many ways that you could not, you potentially would not have been sitting here if those men got their way, right? Yeah. They wanted like other people to do it. So, I mean, I'm sure people who read this book will just be so struck by the sexism, but like, how, how do you feel now and like looking at that and what that experience was like? Uh, sexism is very interesting because it also is comes with a lot of gaslighting yeah. a lot of like you're not experiencing this and like you're uh this is normal so just deal with it and go away so like it it was cathartic in a lot of ways to write to look back on those experiences and realize that i was in the right um what i was experiencing was wrong and the way that people treating were treating me was wrong and I'm, I'm also just proud of myself for rising above it and figuring it out. Um, looking back and seeing like how many walls I was facing. And I don't even think, I, I, I honestly don't think that a lot of the males in this book would ever see the things that they said to me as sexism, but that's the problem. <laughs> Come on, what did you have to do to get that story? I mean, that insinuation? Right. That. Uh, uh, they just, yeah, they, uh, I mean, and, and every woman knows what that feels like to be, he, he didn't have to say the full words of like, you know, <laughs> it doesn't, he didn't have to say the full words, but the way that it made me feel was horrible. And it made me feel like, all I'm ever going to be looked at for every source that I get is um, that I like slept my way into this, basically, which is the opposite of everything that happened. I've been very, very good throughout my entire career um, about like, I, uh, I, it really makes me angry in Hollywood a lot of times. Yeah. Female journalists are almost always depicted as sleeping with sources and flirting their way into scoops and wearing high heels and stomping into a bar and getting the big, the big scoop of the story. But that's not how this went down <laughs> by any means. Uh, and it was hard work. And I, I was really, it was just incredibly frustrating to deal with that level of sexism and then to have this incredibly complicated story going on in the background and trying to figure that out but it all i mean i've learned so much about how much the patriarchy <laughs> affects our society and just everyday little things constantly i tell david all the time and david even knows <laughs> and he sees it all the time he's like this guy but like um, but I, I'm glad that we are seeing it and talking about it. And I know that sexism, like I talk about in my book, takes place in newsrooms across the United States and corporate companies across the United States and, the, and across the world in the exact same way. And I think we all need to talk about it more and call it out. Absolutely. And everyone forgive my appearance. I have a cut due to Hulu on a different project next Monday. So I was like, I should brush my hair for this. And I, I forgot. This um, is what Exactly, <laughs> exactly. We got, I mean, speaking of the patriarchy, we don't have to dress up for that fucking patriarchy. Right, and um, that, that's something too that like I've come to realize like I am very, I'm a lot more comfortable with not focusing on my appearance. When I was yeah. younger, I was, I, I don't know if you were like this in your younger, in your, uh, 20s and in college and things but i really thought that like my appearance mattered so much and i focused on that with my power like thinking my power came from my appearance and that's the more i go in the, the more work that i do i realize like what i look like does not matter and anybody that focuses on that 
is stupid and I don't want them listening to me anyways. Yeah. I mean, I have to be honest, like, um, yeah, I went the opposite way. Right. And like, I've never super cared about my appearance, but I also had like female bosses. Like I work primarily, I worked primarily for HBO and I worked for and with women. Um, and so I think that honestly, you, you, in reading this book, um, I think that you, you experience things I, I really have not, um, which is sort of interesting, but I want to make sure to get into the Murdoch of it. So I read this book. I know a lot about the case, but there was such a transformation in terms of like our evolution and thinking about Paul Murdoch and who he was, and especially Maggie. Can you talk to me? I, I'm saying that too much. Can we talk about, you know, basically your early impressions of Paul and how that changed over the course of your reporting and in writing this book? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was thinking about this last night. Um, one of the questions they had for me was, do you regret anything in your reporting? And ultimately, I don't. And I said that, but I was thinking about it later because I'm one of those people that thinks about questions <laughs> forever. And uh, one, one thing I do regret um, some, I, I was very hard on Paul in my reporting initially I viewed him as a spoiled brat I viewed him as just a a little good old boy a teenager that could do no wrong and was just a terrible person but as I got to know more people who knew him as I and I especially as I got to know and this unfortunately all happened after he died after I got to know what his father was really like um and growing up the son of a manipulative narcissist, narcissist who also like his father protected him from every layer of accountability in his entire life. And that is just a terrible way to raise a child. Paul didn't have a, a chance at being a normal person, especially by the time. And it's sad that a lot of times people are able to like get away from their families and they're in their 20s and 30s and realize that the way that they were raised was wrong Paul didn't get that chance unfortunately his father took that away from him and I and I think with Maggie too but aren't like, we, but aren't we, oh you're saying because he died he wasn't given that chance yes I mean addiction runs such an insane current and I'm I'm lucky to be on eight years sober and recovery Congratulations. Uh, and thank you so much and you know, I just saw so much drinking and inebriation and, you know, like it just felt like it says it, it just, why was there so much drinking in the house for someone that was underage? Like, I mean, I know it's partly a cultural thing, but like it, it, it blew my mind, Mandy. Like what was going on in that house with alcohol? Right. And I think that I, I think that I now get more of a sense that Paul was more of an outcast in his family and because he was he had a lot of mental health problems and instead of actually confronting those and dealing with those in a healthy way I think that they just loaded him up with alcohol and I think that they used alcohol unfortunately as a coping mechanism as a party mechanism coping mechanism cool they they did it to be cool um but it, it's just, it's mind blowing when you look at, I mean, I remember, and I talk about this in the, in the book, um, after Paul was charged, yeah, after, after Paul was charged and um, with Ma in Mallory Beach's death, Maggie's Instagram still had tons of photos of her drinking with her son underage, her drinking with her kids, her son's kid, or her son's friends underage. And that was just really weird to me because I was like, why, how have they not realized now that this is a horrible look, A, and B, they're being sued for this. And uh, are they ever gonna change? And right. I, it's just really sad, but yeah, I think that I think his father was a ma manipulative narcissist. I think alcoholism ran deep in that family. I've heard stories of older Murdochs who um, 
were kind of the, uh, there was one older Murdoch, I don't remember which generation, um, but he had a lot of mental health problems and they just gave him a lot of alcohol and gave him a shed basically and just let him drink all day when he should have been in a mental health facility. Um, and the, there's history there and it's horrible. And I just really developed a lot more empathy for Paul in the way that he was raised. I just don't know. And I understood too that I don't think that his parents would have ever allowed him to be held accountable for the boat crash, mm -hmm. even if he wanted to. And that's really, really sad. Like, I could actually picture Paul now coming to his parents um, um, before he died and saying, like, I would like to plead guilty. And I don't think that his parents would say, I don't think his parents would have allowed that. And that's just horrible. Absolutely. Um, I'd love to talk to you about your writing process. Um, and I know that you worked with the incredible, incredible Carolyn uh, Murnick. Carolyn Murnick, who I believe is on this Instagram live. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that, could you talk a little bit about your process, how you wrote, how you worked with Carolyn? I know that people dream of writing a book, so I'm sure people would really love to know a bit about it. Yeah, um, Carolyn and I worked really, really well together. And I think that that is, that was the most important thing. Um, I started with another writing partner who it just wasn't working. We were both kind of um, just, it, it just wasn't working and that's fine. There's, there's just some people that don't mesh, but Carolyn is organized, <laughs> not. she sticks to deadlines. Um, she had a lot of like motivation and enthusiasm and enthusiasm for this book and was very good about picking up on the larger themes that I really cared about like sexism in the workplace and the good old boy system and people not being held accountable um, she really picked up on all of that very quickly and I think like if I would have just wrote the book by myself a, it would have not been done for years. <laughs> because like, and I don't know. I mean, you have a lot of free time. I don't, I don't think you're making anything. What are you doing? What am I like, doing all day? That's what, yeah, I get asked that all day. What do you do all day? Oh uh, like looking at your output and like the things that you and Luna Sharp, um, you know, who I love every member of that team. Like it's such, it takes a village, but like, yeah, I think uh, it's like, I, I was really, I really responded so well to like the vividness of it, but also you talking about the mental, your mental health struggles as a result of covering this. Like, I just, it seemed almost like sometimes I, the reader isn't sure if you're going to make it through, right? And you sit here today and it's by sheer force of will and figuring stuff out and taking care of yourself. But like Murdoch seemed to come above everything else right and then that me meant that there was a lot of struggle in your in your life and mental health wise and what can you, if you can recall like what was a turning point when you were like i i gotta uh, i gotta make sure that i look after me not just me covering this case um so some point in the, I just started to have like very, I mean, I just started to get very depressed in the fall of 2021 and that just kept, it wouldn't go away. Usually I've had little uh, spills of depression, but it comes and goes and this one was not leaving and it was getting really hard to get out of bed. I was having a lot, a lot of trouble with not i won't i won't call them critics they're trolls they're just people that were out to hate me online and i was not used to that um but also like, like we're not just for i'm sure the people on this most of it know but like this is a different a really different type of trolling these people went into mandy's past posted really disturbing devastating stuff um, you know, I, I don't know. I've been trolled a little bit, but I, I just, I haven't seen anything like that. It was so 
graphic and um, just like uh, it really, really confusing. Yeah, and like evil. Um, right. It was just really, yeah, like very things that people like it was people that really wanted to hurt me and crush me and stop me and i was having a really hard time with that and because of that i was scared to make phone calls with new sources because i was i was terrified i started to get really paranoid and thought people were after me and i just started to kind of close off from the world more and more and there wasn't an exact moment, unfortunately, but I did um, start seeing a therapist in the in 2022 and started to get on medication. And that was very helpful. I, it was the first time in my life I've been on antidepressants and I had avoided it. My I, I just didn't want I don't know. I didn't. It, it's, it's stupid, but the stigma. Um, I was like, I can get through this. I can, but I, I was really glad I reached, I reached that point, got help. And I mean, it, it also wasn't, I wanted it to be a, a light bulb of like, okay, you're not depressed anymore. <laughs> and, but it wasn't like that. Um, it was kind of like layers of clouds lifting and that took a long time to come out of it. But I am very I'm glad that I talk about all of this in the book and it was something Carolyn really wanted. Uh, I probably would have skipped over it because it's hard to talk about these things by yourself. It's hard to, it's hard to look back on really dark times of your life and think about what you were doing and what was happening when you just want to, you want to move past that, you know, but I was glad that Carolyn picked up on these themes, especially the, the toll that the toll on your mental health um, that these stories take on journalists, and I also just want people to know that like it's okay if these stories are too much and they weigh too heavy. Like um, anybody doing this kind of work really needs to take care of themselves because it can be a very scary space to be in. Yeah, I, I mean, it's um, there's a lot of secondary trauma, right? Like yeah. I know by covering sex abuse and murder and rape, um, yeah, it like gets into your skin. And right. I think, you know, to be sort of being thoughtful, I think sometimes even listening or ingesting too much true crime can potentially do that. Um, and so my therapist and I um, been in therapy since I was 18 years old. I am a tender age of 35 now. Um, and yeah, I mean, we just, we, uh, not the same therapist, um, but, uh, you know, we, we basically said there are certain nights that you can watch stuff and certain nights where you have to sort of clear your brain. But what was really, really, really helpful is dogs. I think that really understanding and having access to unconditional love and joy and pureness, like, I just, I always love whenever I get to, I get to Zoom with you and David and like, you know, Luna's there and Luna's barking and da 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 like, you know, was, was, were your dogs like a part of your healing process? Oh, hugely. Um, and my dogs are not, my dogs are at my parents' house right now. <laughs> um, I wish that they were there. They were here. Um, they, like Luna just made me laugh in times when I didn't, and she'd make me get up and go for a walk and dogs, just bring so much light and joy and love to really, really heavy moments. And they have no idea <laughs> what, what you're dealing with, but no matter what, they just love you every day. And like, and I also feel just a sense of security around my dogs. Um, I've been traveling a lot more recently and I'm sure, I know you do this, you travel as well. Do you travel with your dog ever? She's 40 pounds, so she can't, she can't go oh, with me. Erin, yeah. we need to do something with like dog discrimination of weight size. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I also think, honestly, I mean, not to bring the subject matter, I also got a big dog because I have felt scared, right. right? Yeah. And like, you know, and that like they're, you know, Bonnie is a part of my family, actually got 
responding for a court officer of a criminal trial that I was covering. That's awesome. Um, but like, yeah, like I, I yeah, I, I want a big dog because I was like, I've been a, you know, I live alone sometimes, and yeah, I don't know, like it. But then you can't travel with a dog, and it's. I mean, well, this will just devolve into dogs.com, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a bummer. I want my sweetie to be with me all the time. Right. I travel for a living. Right. And you realize it more when you try, like I've just been traveling a lot more in the last couple months, uh, getting ready for this book launch. And yeah, I really miss my dogs when I travel. And it's the, it's like an anxiety relief. It's a, just a comfort of immediate home. And then like you said, unconditional love. And that has been huge. And also being able to work around your dogs. Um, that is just something. Thing that's just so nice. I mean, every time I'm doing the podcast, Luna is always doing something funny. And now I have Joe Pesky, who they are, are hilarious together. And I'll just look up and I'll do something that makes me laugh. And or they'll just come and sit by my side and curl up. And it's it just it brain where normally I would just like stay in that dark cloud of stress and everything the the dogs always make me feel better. So there needs to be more dogs in the workplace also. My dogs are in the other room. I'm, uh, I'm, at, I'm at the office, I brought them. Um, so I know that we, you have a really busy day, but I'd, be, I'd love to hear about like, what is the book launch gonna look like? What's up, what's up next for you? What are you excited about? I saw so many people on this Instagram live saying that their book just got delivered. So like, how can we keep up with you while all this stuff is happening and like tuning in to you putting out this book. Definitely keep up with my Instagram account um, and lunasharkmedia.com slash events will be where we post all things book launch. Um, honestly, I wanted to get through this week before I planned anything further. I don't know if you, I get just very anxious and overwhelmed when I have a lot of events on my calendar. So I'm like, let's see how much I can handle this week and then I'll start to plan out. But definitely going, a, a North Carolina is, North Carolina, Georgia and Tennessee and are three of the probably biggest places with our audience right now. And I am going home for Thanksgiving and I will be speaking at the Kansas Defense Attorneys Council, and I'm excited wow. about that. Yeah, it's 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 an honor. Um, my my parents are really excited about that, and yeah. So I I hope we we will be announcing more events soon. Um, yeah. And I just want to make sure that we I like I skipped I actually like made my way over this, but one of the big big points of the book is talking about your relationship with, um, you know, Sandy Smith and Gloria Satterfield's family, like, you know, what is the current status of both of those sort of cases? And like, how can we keep up with them too, as people that are really the people that went through this sort of firsthand? Yeah. Um, I've been talking with both Eric and Sandy this week um, about new ways to put pressure on the Stephen Smith case and Sandy has been just beyond patient and it is past her time um, she needs she needs more eyes on the case she needs more momentum um, and I told her like as soon as as soon as uh, I get some a little bit more time after this book launches we're gonna go back to Stephen and I promise that I will because that is the case that haunts me forever and it was just really hard the Satterfields were able to get some closure and some you know validation throughout the book um, but the Smith family that's the part that I did not I hated ending the book without any closure whatsoever or any answers and I hope, I hope that this book also gets people talking about the Stephen Smith case again, because that's the one that we need solved and it, everybody has a case that haunts them. That is the one for me that it keeps me up at night and I do not understand what is taking so 
long. I don't understand why more people aren't talking, um, but we're going to do everything that we can to take another look at that case and get the pressure up again because it's so important. Absolutely. Really beautifully said. Um, is there anything that I did not ask you about that you're like, hey, we need to touch on this? No, I don't think so. Well, how, how's the Hulu? How's the show writing going? I should ask you that. Great. Yeah, it's, um, I don't know, Michael is an incredible genius. So lucky to work with him. I'm going back through the podcast for all the trial stuff. So you are in my head, girl. Um, you know, I don't know. I just, it was having written a memoir myself and been vulnerable about my alcoholism and the death of my father. Yeah. I remember what it was like and yeah, it felt like your skin had been removed when you sort of put this book out. Um, and, but then came the beautiful, beautiful messages or that said, I'm three days sober or. I forgave my mom or things like that. And so it's great to make these like media things. Like I make documentaries and you make all, all the things ever that have existed. Um, but it's also like the ephemeral nature of the written word and how it can impact people. And whenever people say that they've like read my book, I said, thank you so much for allowing my voice space inside your head. Yeah. Um, and so, so, like, thank you for allowing your voice in my head for the last two years straight. It's an honor to know you. And I'm so glad that every day you're working hard to get all this done, but also prioritizing yourself and your family and Liz and like the Scooby-Doo gang um, who are the best of the best. You're the best, Aaron. David, do you want to say hi? <laughs> Hey. Thank you so much for doing this, Erin. I really appreciate it. And like you have been a light in very in a very dark world of true crime and a lot of gross people. <laughs> and I met you at a really great time. So thank you for being amazing. And I can't wait to see all the amazing things that you do. And thank you for doing this. Time to get back to it, um, yeah. Mandy. Yeah. Um, everybody who joined, thanks thank so much. And stay tuned to... Mandy's Instagram for more stuff. Yeah, stay pesky. Okay. Bye.